Good morning, New Hope Fellowship. We're so excited to be with you guys today in person, and thank you for you guys who are joining online. Also, thank you to our guest worship leaders, Kyle and uh, Kelly, I'm sorry, Kelly, and April, who's at home. Um, they're from Green Valley Church, and we're so blessed that they are joining us today. So with that, let's all stand and get into worship. Sing this out with me today. Sing, I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I raise a hallelujah, and heaven comes to fight for me, that's right.
Coast mom, and so uh, glad to see you, mom, and give you hugs. But anyway, uh, happy birthday to you, and God bless all of you. Go ahead and be seated. I have a couple of announcements to make, and we're going to get right back in to worship. And by the way, thank you guys for coming and helping us out this morning. And Rennell, uh, thank you for having such a beautiful little girl. Oh my gosh, Eleanor is the cutest baby. Well, I do have some grandchildren that I would say. <laughs> Anyways, glad to see you. A couple things. One is on the 31st, which is a week and a half away, we're going to have a Seder dinner, a modified Seder, meaning that it's not going to be the entire meal because that would take a long time. We're going to have matzo ball soup and uh, cake. And so the recipes are on the table. And we need to know how many are planning to come because that's important. And then with that, we need to have folks sign up to make the matzo ball soup, the recipes are there, and then the cake. Our guest is going to be Jacob Cohen. Jacob is a good friend of mine. We served as chaplains with the Sheriff's Department for a number of years. He's Jewish from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, he has stories, but he has such a uh, history of the Jewish faith because as being raised a Jew and going to Hebrew school and all that, he has such insight. So he's going to share with us uh, the meaning of the Seder. And that's the Passover meal that Jesus had with the disciples before he was crucified. Also, it's the meal the Israelites ate at that first exodus from Egypt. And so that's really the beginning of what we observe usually as communion. So it's all tied together. And he's going to unpack all that for us on that evening as we enjoy some matzo ball soup and some good fellowship so if you'll sign up today if you're coming and if you would like to uh, bring one of those dishes would really help out I think it'd be a great evening that's the 31st six o'clock it'll last about an hour to maybe an hour and 20 minutes so anyway be, it's gonna be a great time together secondly I have a, a project list and there's some things I'd like to see us get done you know we've been kind of not really shut down but you know as a church we've been kind of um, for this past year has been crazy, hasn't it? You know, opening up restaurants now is kind of fun. You, oh, we can go inside and eat now? Wow, how about that? You don't have to order it and go sit in your car and eat. Well, anyway, uh, there's some things about the church facility that I'd like to see us get done. Like, uh, you can read the list. But what I'd like you to do is we're going to pass this around. And if you can help out with any of these projects, put your name by it. And then uh, I'll contact you and you'll say, oh, no, I'll be on the hook. Yeah, you will be. But, hey, it's your church, too, right? And so I'm going to start handing this out. But uh, <laughs> what did I say? Allison looked at me like, ah! Anyway, here's a project list. And uh, help me out with this. We want to make sure that our church is up and running full, full tilt. How about that? Amen? Amen. Is that good? Amen. We're a family, right? And so uh, there's the list there. Third and last is uh, we have an opportunity, Daniel mentioned last week, you know, we've been on Facebook Live now for a year, but a lot of people are not on Facebook, and so we can broadcast the service to them. We want to change the platform, which will include YouTube, Facebook, and some others, but we need some help managing it. And so if that IT stuff is up your alley, we would love to have you connect with us so we can make sure that we get the... Uh, services out to as many people as possible. Some have requested, hey, if you're on this platform, I could watch. And so we want to help that. And so if that is something you could help us with, see Danielle or me, and we'll uh, fix you up. So with that said, hey, let's stand. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to get right into worship. So Father, thank you this morning for 90 years of faithful life. Vanine, bless you, our dear sister. 
And God, we pray your blessing on each and every one of us, our families this morning. And we lift up each one. You know the needs in all of our lives. And so as we gather this morning to worship you, we come to raise a hallelujah. We come to see the enemy defeated because of our love for you and our dedication to following you, Jesus. And so use this time to inspire us, draw us closer together as a body, but also unto you. And for that, we thank you, Lord. In your name, amen. Go ahead.
a new one for us all today. It's called Graze in the Gardens. And the story of this song is how God can bring dead things to life. What we all see is dead in this world. It's not dead to him because he has the power over death. Amen. And he can bring that and raise it to life. So we want to pray what's dead inside of us today, what we may be blind to, that God brings it to life today. Come on. I searched the world It couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along That's right. And put me back together now satisfied here in your love yeah oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you this I know to show you my weakness cause my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend Amen cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valleys and there's not a place your mercy
lift that up. Let's sing that again. There's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. with you Jesus and how great is your love how great is your love for me even before I was born you had a plan for my life before I spoke a word you were singing oh You have been so, so good to me. Yes, you have. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Amen. You have been so, so kind to me. Come on, with all you got. Oh, the overwhelming.
kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Sing that again. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. That's right. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. With all you got, no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. just want to come to you and say thank you for being so, so good to us, Lord. In this day and age, Lord, there's so many things out there where we could just feel so lonely, but you just come to us and you fight for us, Lord. And we are just so, so grateful. Thank you, Jesus. And as we continue um, our worship today through our giving, um, at this time we'd like to release the children back to um, the children's ministry. And uh, last week we had a four-square pastor pass away. His name was Timothy Tippy Tap. And um, you guys may be seated too. We wanted to share a video um, that just really shows, you know, when we give to missions, when we give to the church, um, you'll get to see this is why. And because of your guys' faithfulness, um, we are able to spread the word of God all throughout uh, the world. So with that, let's uh, take a look at this video. Papua New Guinea is a really unique place. It's a, it's a country of about 7 million people, but over 800 languages. And uh, within those 800 languages, even th uh, thousands of different uh, tribal groups and their, their cultures and their traditions are very different from one another's. And it's all contained in this really rugged Pacific Island. Church of the Foursquare Gospel in Papua New Guinea began in 1956 uh, by one of our missionaries from uh, Foursquare Mission International U.S., uh, Dr. Mason Hughes. This may have been one of the first places where we went into a completely unevangelized country. And so the Hughes ended up going out to an area called the Dumentina Valley, which was a very remote area, uh, and they, they pretty much had to do everything. They had their first converts after, after about five years of, of hard labor. They began to see some fruit. My grandfather, Sebdut Mason Hughes, he was the first one to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
1983, uh, the grace came. That's Frank and Kathy with the uh, three children, Michael, Paul, and Becky. Frank built the bridges, and Frank brought the, uh, the unity to the work, and then Frank began to hand over the, the authority and the leadership to the nationals. Frank and Kathy, they saw the national uh, leadership, the quality of leadership in the Foursquare Church. They recognized that, so they uh, felt that that was the time that they should leave the work to the end of the national leadership. They came here, they didn't control everything. They teach our nationals, and now the nationals are running the uh, church here, and now the Foursquare Church in Papua New Guinea is growing. People in Papua New Guinea, whether Christians or non-Christians, they know about the Foursquare Gospel Church because of what God has been doing in the Foursquare family. So many doors God has opened for the church to open his arms up, even through education, through health services, through remote places. And God has used the Foursquare Church to reach out to many people, both Christians and non-Christians, saving them and also preaching to them the Word of God. We have four Bible colleges in Papua New Guinea to train pastors to become self reliant, tent making missionaries in their local area or village setting. And by doing that, uh, we will build a long-term church in the village setting in Papua New Guinea. We work together. We have no differences, again, among us. That's why we see good things happening here. When we come to church and worship the Lord, we feel it in our heart. We are telling them the truth. We are not keeping anything hidden from them because we believe if we tell them the truth, they will be set free and they will be able to make the decisions. And that's the joy I like about Foursquare family. We speak the truth, we tell the truth. Papua New Guinea is no longer dependent on outside support. They are self-reliant, they are self-governing, and they are now sending missionaries to spread the gospel into the Pacific Islands. They're like a big brother to many of the Pacific Islands. So they've sent missionaries into the other half of the island, which is called West Papua or Irian Jaya. They've got a missionary serving in Kiribati, who's doing pioneer work. They've got a missionary family in the Solomon Islands. They've sent a missionary into Vanuatu and, so, and, and missionaries uh, down into Australia working with Aboriginal peoples. And so the Papua New Guineans really, really do have a vision to take the gospel to the nations. People have left their country to put the good news in Papua New Guinea. And it's our turn now to leave our country and take the good news out to the next country that is near us. I think there's a legacy uh, that's been invested in that nation. I think that uh, spiritually uh, we've had the opportunity to make a deep deposit and to see transformation take place in the nation. From our founding missionary, Mason Hughes, to Paul and Karina's son, Mason, named after Mason Hughes, uh, you, you just see the continuation of that legacy and the change is obvious. I want to thank the National Church for pioneering the work of Foursquare in Papua New Guinea and bringing us this far and releasing the work to the national level and continuing to partner. When I look at Papua New Guinea in my own experience, I know uh, Mason Hughes and we're friends with missionaries that are from Australia and from the Philippines that all came and sacrificed uh, and, and said yes to the call to come to Papua New Guinea and to see today that there's somewhere around 1,300 something four square churches in the country uh, and to see thousands of people that love Jesus in that country and seeing uh, how everyone had you know, their hands on it and seeing the stages of development within the four square church of the leaders as they've grown, as they've developed, it's really great to see. Well, I hope that inspired you. Uh, you've given many of you to missions, and that's part of the fruit. Uh, when I first came to the Lord in Concord, North Carolina, there was this, uh, in the entryway of the church there, there was this uh, frame, and in it were these spears that were the most wicked-looking things I'd ever seen. I mean, these things had barbs going backwards like fish hooks, and you knew once that penetrated somebody, it would never come out. 
unless it went all the way through. And those were a gift from Papua New Guinea to my home, home church for their support in missions. Mason and Virginia Hughes went in the 1950s, and for five years they labored with no visible result. But now 1,600 churches exist because of faithful people and faithful giving that uh, many of you have participated in through the years. And I just want to celebrate that with you because that's a world-changing thing. Amen? And uh, worth... Yeah. Worth partnering with. Uh, Mason is still alive. He uh, lives in Concord, North Carolina, of all places. And uh, it's a funny thing. One year, Allison and I were on vacation in San Antonio, Texas, and we're in this water park, and uh, you know, going through the lazy river. And I look up, and here's Mason Hughes right in front of me. Mason, what are you doing here? And he says, Jim, what are you doing here? <laughs> and so it was kind of fun that you never know when you're going to run into somebody, but a guy like him. What a tremendous, what a tremendous friend and uh, minister of the gospel to take his three kids and live in those early days in a hut with no windows, uh, no doors really, and up to 200 people every day looking in their windows, watching them brush their teeth, get dressed, the whole thing. And uh, they survived that among people that had been cannibals. And uh, you saw the early outfits. We're going to have those available for you next Sunday. <laughs> no, not really. Anyway, what obstacles did they overcome? You know, think about, would you do that as a young family to take off and go to some place like Papua New Guinea and live among people that you couldn't speak their language, they couldn't speak yours, with a vision that God would use you? What faith, but what obstacles did they have to overcome? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Obstacles that oppose my faith. Obstacles we all deal with. Well, maybe you've never heard of Alex Zanardi. Is that, does that name ring a bell to anybody? Well, I didn't think so. It didn't say anything to me until I read his story. But he's a son of a plumber from a little town in, in Italy. And... Uh, he lost both legs in an auto accident. Well, it wasn't just an auto accident. He uh, was, uh, 2001, during a race in Liebsun something, Germany. I can't pronounce the name. It's about that long and has, I don't know, 20 letters in it. But in that race is a Formula One car. He was in a crash and lost both legs. And you would think by losing both legs in a Formula One race, his career was over. Well, that didn't stop him. Surviving that crash, crash, which was nothing short of impossible or incredible, only two years after the crash in a car fitted with hand controls, which some thought was just a feel-good measure by the sponsors and the F1 racing promoters, he scored four F1A World Tour car championship wins during five seasons as a BMW factory driver. Can you imagine driving a race car at over 200 miles an hour with just hand controls and having no legs? That didn't stop him, but he went on and took up hand cycling. And in hand cycling in the Paralympic Games in 2012 and 2016, he won the gold medal. Overcome obstacles, if you will. So what enables you? What enables me to overcome setbacks and obstacles? Think of Peter. On the night before Jesus was to be crucified, here Peter's in the courtyard. You know the story, and the young gal goes up, hey, are you one of Jesus' followers? And what does Peter say? I have no idea who he is. Don't, don't accuse me. Three times that happened. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt in those next couple of days? Oh, my gosh. It was devastating. And, and how many of his friends would remember that event? And it would dog him, not only the enemy sitting right on his shoulder, telling him again and again and again through his life, you're a failure. You denied Jesus. How can you expect God to ever answer your prayers? So I want to ask you a question today about obstacles and about following the Lord. And you know the stories of the life of Jesus, and which one of those stories would you choose to be at? 
the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the lame man, the time when the friends took the tiles off of the roof and let their friend down to be healed by Jesus? Would you have been in Simon's house? Would you have been with Zacchaeus up in the tree? I mean, which story would, would grab your heart? And I don't know which one I would really pick, but I go through those. And I'd love to be in there on early Sunday morning when Jesus said, when the angel said, he's risen from the dead. How about you? When he's risen. And in a couple weeks, Easter is going to be here. We'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And in preparation for that today, I want to look at some of the obstacles that would keep us from really digging into that historic reality that has shaped our faith. Have you ever been in those moments that are so majestic you could just soak it in? And I think Peter exemplifies some of those things for me. He has a kind of personality that he just can't be quiet. You know, he's always about blurting out things. And this event that Jesus had Peter with him up on the mountain of the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John are there. And as Peter and James and John are there, Moses and Elijah appear. And Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter, without any prompting other than that, he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, heaven and earth didn't reveal that to you. I mean, you didn't get that off the newspaper, Peter. You had divine revelation. He said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And that statement of faith is what you and I have entered into. At some point in our lives, we've come to realize, Jesus, you are the Christ, and I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to follow you. And we endeavor to follow the Lord. We endeavor to strike out and say, Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll serve you as best I can. But how many of us have faced some obstacles and we've tripped, we've fallen, we've messed up? And we've thought, well, I'm done. God will never use me. He can't do anything through my life because I've screwed it up. Anybody? Anybody? You know what? Look around. It's every single one of us. I'm glad to be in the company of people who aren't perfect. How about you? Because I've been in the company of some people who thought they were, and it was miserable. Because they weren't, and they knew it, but they sure tried to make everybody think they were, and that's just horrible. So as we open up our Bibles this morning, let me ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and it's one of those passages we all love to read and think about and imagine that we could be somehow being the ones spoken to, and in reality, we are. It says this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, we also... And you know, whenever there's a therefore in Scripture, you need to know what it's there for, right? You've heard that before. But it references all that took place in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the hall of fame of faith in the Bible. It's got all, pe all kinds of people like Abraham and Moses and Rahab the harlot. The harlot? I mean, she was there. Not yeah, she's there. And on and on and on and on and on. These names of heroes. And I imagine Mason Hughes' name might be there because of what he did. And Timothy Tippy Tap. Isn't that a great name? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, this morning, as we open up your word, draw our hearts to you, cause us to look beyond the obstacles, cause us to look beyond our failures, and look to you as the author 
and the finisher of what you've begun in us. And Lord, inspire us to live more valiantly for you and all you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The first century Christians came from primarily a Jewish background. They were all Jews. And when the writer is writing to the Hebrews, meaning this Jewish group, he heard that many of them were thinking about turning away, turning away from following Jesus because they were facing some opposition. They were facing some obstacles some persecution had begun happening, and they thought, well, it would be easier if I just go back and, and be Jewish, and I won't have to deal with all of this Jesus stuff and the resurrection and the crucifixion and all that that entailed, and I'll just go over here and go to the synagogue and be like I was before. And really, in a way, that's no different than many of us, that you know, there's times in our lives where we think, I don't know, I don't get it, this church thing and following God and being on the worship team or teaching Sunday school or you name it. I mean, it's all there. And people think, oh, it's just not worth it. I'm, it's not working out for me. Uh, people are mean to me or whatever it is. And we come up with all this stuff. And you see, sometimes people fade away. And later you might ask them, well, what happened? To you? Well, I just got discouraged or I got my eyes on people rather than on Jesus and Pretty soon, brr, we downward spiral. And the writer of Hebrews writes to them, he says, don't ever forget those early days when you first learned about Christ. He said, don't ever forget that. Remember how you faith were, were faithful even though it meant suffering. Even though it meant difficulty, he says, don't forget, but now they're in danger of going back. They're in danger of falling away. And they were considering abandoning the faith, much like Peter on the night when he denied Jesus three times. Imagine he thought, well, I'll just go fishing and forget everything else. But aren't you glad Jesus didn't allow him to do that? He grabbed hold of him. And I love the song we sang a while ago, thank you guys for leading us in reckless love. There's no wall he won't tear down, no lie he won't kick down, tie down, I, something like that. <laughs> these passages, these two verses give us some ways to overcome some obstacles. I want to go through them with you real quick this morning. First is, how do we maintain that overcoming attitude? And first of all, it's by examining the example of those who've gone before us. There's a list in Hebrews 11, and it even says there in the latter part of the chapter, it says in verse 30, listen to this, just listen. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. And by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish for those who didn't believe. And what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. And they quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. They became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens. Verse 35, women received their dead raised to life. Others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And verse 36, still others had trial of mockings and scourgings and chains and imprisonment. Can you believe this? What they went through, they were stoned, they were sawn in half. They were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world is not worthy. The world is not worthy of these, it says. Wow, we've got it pretty easy. Oh God, I have a broken fingernail. You know, we whine about the most insignificant things when those who've gone before us have endured things like this. Wow, it's almost like I'd hear the Lord saying, shut up. Quit your complaining. But why are these there in Scripture? 
Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It says these are there to inspire us, to show us, hey, you can make it too. And you will. See, the Bible's not just a history book. It's not meant to be a record of everything that happened in the past. It's not about just moral teachings or, or, or things to just give us a little bump. But it's written so in times where we're lacking in strength, we read these stories and it inspires us. I've had the privilege of knowing Mason Hughes and sitting with him. He's been to our church. It's been many years ago, but he and Vir Virgine, his wife, came. This is probably back in the late 80s. What a hero. And men and women that we've known, missionaries who've changed nations. And I think about them and I'm inspired by them. What a privilege, huh? But who do you know? that inspires you? Who is it that, that you could look to and say, oh, thank you, God, for their example. Thank you for what they've done. It inspires me. And I know they've had hardship. I know they aren't perfect. And no one is. But they made it. And because they made it, I know I can too. Amen? Number two, how do we overcome? By removing the obstacles that could trip us up. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. What weight slows you down? We all have them. You ever have those ankle weights for walking or jogging where you wrap them around your ankle and they weigh maybe a couple of pounds each and you put them on and you, oh man, it's hard to move. Last night in our house, we had a house full of kids and family and I saw my daughter going through the house and had... Two kids wrapped around her ankles. And she's trying to walk like this. It was tough. It was a struggle. And that reminds me of what this says. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that hinders our progress. In virtually every kind of athletic event, excess weight is not good, unless you're a sumo wrestler, that is. A few years ago, there was a, a London marathon, and, and history records it was the slowest marathon in history. Lloyd Scott finished in five days, yeah, five days, eight hours and 29 minutes and 46 seconds. It's got to be a record. Unlike other runners who are wearing, you know, the little running shorts and all that, he was wearing a diver's suit with full metal helmet and lead-weighted boots, and he did it as a fundraiser. <laughs> I hope he earned a lot of money. <laughs> Can you imagine five days, eight hours, in this slogging suit trying to do this marathon? But he did it to, to, for a good cause. But what a picture of some of us. We're trying to follow the Lord, and we got all this junk hanging on. And he says, let go of it. Let go of the sin. Let go of the hindrances. Let go of the things. That, and you know what they are because the Holy Spirit is so faithful, isn't he? He speaks to us all the time. He says, hey, stop that. Don't do that anymore. Don't go there. Quit. I mean, you know, these little promptings, many people say, I never hear God speak. And I say, oh, you probably do. You just tune him out. It's true, but he's always, he loves you. And he's always wanting to prompt you for a better way, a better life. Let go of not only sin, but let go of the unnecessary. What's unnecessary in your life? It might not be sin particularly, but it's simple, something as simple as your life is so full of other stuff. It crowds out the Lord. And as a follower of the Lord, he's supposed to be, and we want him to be first in our life, right? Don't we? But sometimes everything else crowds in and, you know, it just consumes us. In Timothy, 
Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4, he says, Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. He gets rid of anything that is unnecessary, all the civilian affairs that distract him from being the kind of soldier God wants him to be. And so whatever it is that would be hindering you as a soldier of the Lord, he says, hey, it's, it's got to go. Third is dealing with the obstacles. We do it by pressing on until we cross the finish line. There is a finish line. And some of us will face it and f complete it before others. He says here, let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. What is that race? We each have one. And it's that journey that the Lord has given you, this journey he's given me. And down through the ages, it's no less true in our generation, greatness has been defined by the ability to persevere and overcome obstacles that would hinder us in doing what we've been called to do. But obstacles come. And sometimes people are not nice to us. People stand in our way. Listen to just a couple of these. You've all heard Vince Lombardi, great football coach of the Green Bay Packers. Early in his career, you know what they said about him? He possesses minimal football knowledge. That's what they said. Walt Disney was fired one time by a newspaper he worked for. Guess why? For lack of ideas. Thomas Edison's teacher gave him up, and here was their evaluation. He's too stupid to accomplish anything. Henry Ford, before he succeeded, failed and went broke five times. Beethoven handled the violin awkwardly, and his teacher called him hopeless. Beethoven. Albert Einstein performed so badly in high school, except in mathematics, his teachers encouraged his parents to take him out of school. What have people said about you? <laughs> well, you know, there's times when people are not kind, and, oh, you'll never make it, you'll never succeed, you'll never do that. And I find that that's one of the greatest encouragements for me to prove them wrong. <laughs> I'll show you. Alice is laughing at me. <laughs> My grandfather inspires me. He was a pastor in North Carolina. He started a church out in the countryside back in the 1930s, pastored it for 30 years. And I remember going when it was just a, an old wood frame building. And one day there was a fire, the wood stove they had to heat the building, the uh, chimney or the, the stack caught fire, the roof. And they had no water on the property and the closest water was about a quarter of a mile away at a house at an intersection down the road. And the men of the church had to run down there with buckets and get water. And you know what? The hole in the roof never got bigger than this. Miracle? Yeah, I think so. There's so, so many stories of, of his life. But who is it that you look to and say, oh, God, thank you for that person. Thank you for, for their example. And guess what? Now you're an example. Did you see the kids running around here a while ago? You're an example to them. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, they're looking to you. And one day they'll say, oh, that guy at church, that lady at church, oh, that guy that taught my class, and, and they'll recite those things. And all the while you're going, oh, don't look too close. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite scriptures is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Aren't you glad for that? Your labor is not in vain. Another translation says, be steadfast, immovable, no matter what the hardship, no matter what obstacle comes. 
Paul would write this in 2 Corinthians 11. He said, I've been in prison. I've been flogged. I've been exposed to death time and again. Five times beaten with 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Oh my gosh, you think the guy would quit? No, he didn't. And neither have you. One time my dad said this to me. I never forgot it. He said, a winner never quits, and a quitter never wins. And I said, yeah, that's true. A winner never quits, and a quitter never wins. And I thought, I'll take that. How about you? Paul said it this way. I can testify that I never gave up. And so wherever you're at today, whatever's been going through your life, whatever you've been dealing with, don't quit. Peter could have quit. I think he almost did. But Jesus didn't let him. And he's not going to let you either. The fourth way is overcoming obstacles by having a single-minded focus. And he says in this passage in Hebrews, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Our faith depends on him. And even though we might look to examples around us, yet they're not the definition because I found this. Eventually, if you look at someone's life long enough, you'll find something that will possibly discourage you, right? Do we all have clay feet? Meaning that we are all human. In Bible college, I was loading trucks my first year, working at UPS and then another truck terminal. And one day I said, God, I uh, thank you for the job, but is there another job that's going to help me become what you've called me to be? And I didn't know I wanted to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. I still don't. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, seriously, people would say to me, what are you going to be? I said, pastor, no way. I don't want that. Well, God sneaks up on us, doesn't he? And he does things. But anyway, within another week, a friend of mine said, hey, they're hiring over at Foursquare International. I went, well, they wouldn't want me. They, no, go apply. And so I did apply, and I got the job. So I began working for the uh, general supervisor of the United States, Dr. Nichols. And uh, I worked there five years. And during that time, the regional supervisors from all over the United States would come in, and I would have to deal with them about church matters and things, mainly with church loans, building buildings, that sort of stuff. And one day I was praying for all these, all these men and women. And I said, God, why am I here? And I felt the Lord speak to my heart. And he said, I want you to see them as examples. And notice that they all have clay feet. And I learned something about those men and women. None of them were perfect. They all love Jesus passionately. And many of them have gone and be with the Lord, but I was privileged to know them and to, and to be there with them. And, oh, what a, what a great thing. And also, during that time, I met my wife. So, hey, there we go, right? But it sounds spiritual to say, keep your eyes on Jesus. But how do you do it? In everyday life, what would, you, what would that look like? And I think it would look like even in the midst of COVID, even in the midst of all this thing, there's been a lot of stress. There's been a lot of changes, work situations, school has changed for kids. Parents, my goodness, some of you, you're going to school three, four times a day to deal with, get your kids and pick them up. God bless you. And now as we're moving into spring, things are opening up more and more, and the tendency is that we're going to be thrust out into normal, hello, whatever that looks like, and the pace is going to pick up. But in the midst of that, you might have a tendency to lose your focus on the Lord. And I want to encourage you to set yourself now to say every day I'm going to spend five minutes, two minutes, two hours, whatever you can do, but I'm going to spend some time with Jesus to set my compass and be with him and if you do that it's like Paul wrote in Philippians 3 not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected 
but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I love that verse. He says, what's more, I consider everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ as my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, and I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, Paul knew the difference between life and death, between living and not living. Last, how do we overcome obstacles? By enduring the junk to experience the joy. There's junk that's going to come. It comes to all of us. And the writer of Hebrews uses Jesus as an example of someone who kept an eternal perspective. Look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, finisher rather, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Think about that line for a minute. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy? And I think that joy was seeing you and millions of others through the centuries like us who said, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I'll still follow. You know the song, that old song, I have decided. And I think when Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, he's thinking about all of you. One day, their lives are going to be changed by the power of what I'm doing. And that motivated him. That's the joy set before him. What motivates you? I want to see yourself. I want you to see yourself as crossing that finish line one day and standing with this group of heroes of faith. And maybe you'd say, well, I've not done anything, but I guarantee every one of us has the opportunity to touch someone's life and make a difference. And it's my prayer that in this next season, you're going to make the difference in a ton of people for Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Worship team, if you'll come back and help us wrap it up. I want to pray for you. Jesus, as we gather before you this morning, as we prepare over the next couple of weeks for Easter and that wonderful season that you went through for us, Lord, we just ask you to forgive us this morning. For those that say, I've got an obstacle. I've got something in my life that's holding me back. And I ask you this morning to speak to each of us and in a way that we understand that you're not condemning us. Because your word says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But you do prompt us to tell you about it. To say, God, take this out of my life. I don't want it anymore. I want to live for you. So we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us of any and all things that would hinder us. Lord, some things are unnecessary. We pack our lives with so much stuff. We get so busy. We crowd everything out that's good. And help us clarify over these next couple of weeks, coming into Easter, say, Lord, why am I here? Why do you put me on planet Earth? What's my purpose? What's my reason for living? And help me clarify that so that we can live for the purposes of God. And Lord, with that, draw our hearts together with one another that we may be an inspiration, that in our coming and fellowshipping each week, we're reminded how important it is that our example inspires others and others' examples inspire us. Thank you for your love, for your grace and your goodness. And in Jesus' name, everybody said together, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, worship team.